Scott Hageman, uh, one of our volunteers, and, and uh, put, puts together super presentations, and, and uh, he has a little connection to the fire department here in Chagrin that you may know. His son's a fireman. His daughter's married to a fireman. And uh, so he's, he's uh, got a little of his part in this. Um, I also want to take just a few minutes and introduce some people. We got Bruce Zeger, who's our executive director. Back there. Hello. Hello. And then, uh, Maggie Wilson is our newest employee. Hello. Hello. Thanks for that. And it was her job tonight to check you in. Oh, so yeah. if, you, if you didn't get checked in, make sure you, you touch base with, with Maggie. Um, you know, a few other people that are here, thanks to, to Jeff and Patty always for what they do. Sally was here earlier setting up. Ken Kabacek, one of our trustees, uh, helped set up here also and is always helping with things in the facility. Carolyn Seeler is here, one of our trustees, and uh, Bob Norwick in the back is one of our trustees, so it's nice to have them come into our programs. So I think you're going to enjoy this program tonight. I want to remind you that we are uh, primarily self-funded, and there is a donation box in the back that you can uh, put some, something in if you so desire. Uh, and if you're not a member, there's membership information there. So please take some time and, and grab one of those and uh, we'd love to have you be part of our organization here. But that I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you. I'm sure you have now. I hope you know that the food in the back has a fire theme. We have smoked cheese and smokies. <laughs> 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 so we're going to talk about the fires and chagrin. And I'm going to concentrate on the major fires that were in the town. I'm not going to go over any home fires that people lived in, because that wouldn't be right to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about all those restaurants that burned down in Bainbridge that had fire in their name, like <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> burn me down and ashes to ashes or whatever. They <laughs> Mostly I'll just talk about the main fires in Chagrin. <laughs> the first fire in Chagrin, Chagrin was formed in 1833. And it didn't take very long to have the first fire. But they had one in 1834. Uh -huh. So in 1834, there were only seven families in Chagrin at the time. First of all, can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. There were only seven families in the town. There were no buildings really yet except for a few barns and a few homes and a lot of people lived together in the same home and one of those guys was Sam Bushnell who built this barn over here this wasn't here yet and he lived in that barn with another family while he was building his house so while they lived in there they heated the barn with a wood-burning stove and it caused a fire and back then there were, like I said there was only seven families there was no fire department there was no fire fighting equipment so they had to do a bucket brigade from the river 
to bring the water up and try to put the barn out. Luckily, the barn was still there. You can see it later in this picture. So it's injured and down and didn't do a whole lot of damage. But it pointed out that Sprint kind of needed a fire department already in 1934. What were the streets where that was located? That's okay, show you. So this would be Orange Street, and this is Grove, going up Grove Hill. So that's that's where Phillips uh, gas station okay, is today. So that's, that's West Orange. What that's that West be. Orange and going. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, if you guys know something when I'm at a fire and you know more information than I do, tell me because I want to learn it. I'm not the expert. I just looked at some of the papers to try to get information on it. Now some of these I don't expect you to know because I don't think any of you guys were around then. <laughs> My brother might. <laughs> The next one I'm going to talk is the Phoenix block. And that happened in 1868. So this is a picture where I'm standing at the bottom of Grove Hill, looking down into town. So this is Huntington Bank building. This is Schutz's Hardware. Did it kind of order Bob Bellows. This here is the old uh, Champion building. It predates the town hall. And those brick buildings right here is the Phoenix block. And this was taken very soon after they were built. Prior to them being there, that was a block of wooden buildings called the Merchant's Block. And it's called that because they were merchants there. And in 1860, they had many fires over the years, but in 1868, the second building, which was, these were all wood, had a dentist office up there, and they had a cold stove. And it overheated and burned down the entire block which was a problem with wooden buildings because they weren't very fireproof. So Chagrin decided at the time that <coughs> we should rebuild in brick and make it a little more fire, not fireproof, but less prone to fire. So they built this block of buildings and they call it the Phoenix block because it rose from the ashes. <laughs> but it really hasn't changed over the time. The longest tenant was the exponent and they were down on the lot. <coughs> far north of the buildings. They were there from the 1870s to the 1960s, so almost 100 years. And a lot of the information that you're going to hear today actually came from the exponents reporting of the fires. And you also notice River Street in the background. There's very little, it's not quite the same as it is. <laughs> it was dirt road, there's a whole bunch of mills. You're going to see another picture in a second. There's a lot of trees back there too. You notice the ravine in front of the building that would take water and sewer and run it down back into the river. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not showing the outhouses. <laughs> this is 1914, looking back at the Phoenix block. Notice all the buildings where Riverside is today. That's where the old Planey Mill and sawmills were. Also, notice how deep the water is. On the other side of the bridge was a dam on top of the natural falls. It was about four feet high. So that made the river about four feet high all the way back to the other dam. And powered the mills on this side of the river. And there's from the 1950s. Look at River Street there with all the trees and everything. It used to be a pretty place. It was almost park-like for a while. next major fire was the park block. For those of you who don't know, the park block is this group of buildings here right by Triangle Park. Guess why they call it the park block? <laughs> so, so in 1875, they built Triangle Park. And they culverted over a ravine that I'm going to talk about a little later in the presentation. and made a nice little park and made sure it looked better downtown. But in 1873, before they did that, there was a bunch of wooden buildings in that same location. And they had a terrible fire that got out of hand and burned down the entire group of wooden buildings. And it took them two years to rebuild the new buildings out of brick. And it just coincided with the timing of building the new park, and that's why they called it the park block. Again, if you were at the last presentation, this little house here was built by Henry Church Sr. It was there until they built the McClintic building, and they moved that to Hall Street, where it's sitting today. And the park block really hasn't changed much at all over the years. I mean, 
I showed you a picture here from the 1800s. If you didn't see the people in the wagon, you may not be able to tell me exactly when that picture was taken. They've had a lot of different tenants in these buildings over the years. By the way, these buildings are much older. These are 1860s here. These were the 1875 This building here, where Stepin is today, that was the site in 1920 of Chagrin's only bank robbery and murder. A bunch of bank robbers came in, were robbing the bank. A gentleman named Aaron Chance lived upstairs. He came down to see what the commotion was. They yelled at him, get out of here. Fast enough, maybe. They shot off a shotgun and got him in the leg, and he bled to death. Oh, as far as we can find, he's the only murder in Chagrin, although there was a manslaughter in Chagrin where a person got killed by accident. <coughs> Williams Foundry in 1892. So the location of this is where West Washington Street hits Church Street. So where those big houses are down by the river now. And this was built on the first dam on the river that Mr. Bushnell built that owned the barn that burned down in the first fire in Sugar Falls. He had a sawmill on the other side of the river, and they built a foundry on this side. And the Williams family took over the foundry relatively early in its history. And they were famous for making empire wood or cold beer burning stoves. And they made sad irons. Those are those old irons that you would put on your stove and pick it up with a wooden handle that you'll see opening every door in this building. <laughs> they were, if not the number one, very close to being the number one manufacturer of sad, sad irons in the United States. But they were also one of the first guys to make cast iron toys for kids, too. They made little cars and trucks that would roll. And they made very cool banks. And if you ever see a picture of it, very intricate designs of animals and buildings and clowns and all kinds of different designs. But this being a foundry, you know they're going to have some fires over the year because the foundry has a furnace and the furnace is burning 24 hours a day every day. So you're going to have some fires. Also the location they have right there on the river, they had a lot of damage from floods. So the poor guy, if he wasn't burning down, he was flooded. <laughs> In 1889, Mr. Williams was in Chicago, and he was at a play, and they stopped the play, and they came out as, is there a Mr. Williams in the audience from Chagrin? <coughs> Call Chagrin, your, your factory's burning down. <laughs> so, uh, he didn't stick for the second act. <laughs> he went home, found out that it, it was burned completely to the ground. He didn't have enough insurance to rebuild it, so he was going to have to go out of business. But because it was one of the main employers in Chagrin, the employees agreed to work for free for a number of months. And a lot of the people that provided services and materials for Mr. Williams gave him either free service or free materials or really reduced prices so he could rebuild. And he rebuilt it, and he was very, very active in the community. He used to have Williams Days, which is like blossom time. He would have parades and everything, and the town would come and enjoy it. What was it called? William State. Oh, William State. That makes sense. <laughs> I did say. <laughs> well, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Who are you, my brother? <laughs> <laughs> but in 1892, it burned down again. And Mr. Williams finally had, had enough. Part of his complaint, and a lot of people at Chagrin over the years complained, that Chagrin didn't have a fire department. If there was a fire, you had people who would volunteer to put it out, they would have an alarm, but everybody would bring their own horses and they'd go to Washington Gates house to get the pump wagon. And then they'd go over to Irving Pope's place to get the wagon with the ladders. And then they'd go over to this guy's house to get the hoses. <coughs> Those guys weren't home. Ah, well, crap, what are we gonna do? <laughs> like break into the barn or what? And they complain, complain that we need a fire department. And they never got around to do it, at least not by 1892. So Mr. Williams said, I haven't had enough. And he moved to Ravenna. And they're still in business in Ravenna today. Oh, it's called Light Metals today. But they're in the exact same location, nowhere near our river. <laughs> and very close to the fire department. <laughs> this one you guys have probably heard of. The Irving House was a great big hotel in Chagrin. It started life as the Eggleston. Picture of the Eggleston House. And this is about where Key Bank is. 
right here is about where White Magnolia is, and this is the bridge. If you look at the bridge, you'll see a log in the middle of it. That's a 1855 lane marker. <laughs> so you go on this side of the log or that side of the log. But in 1853, Mr. Eggleston had bought the property. There was a little building there that was being used as a hotel, but it was much smaller than this. He moved it back towards the parking lot of the shopping plaza now, which wasn't there, obviously. And he built this beautiful building. And it was just to the point where they were about to put the plaster in it when the barn started on fire. Unfortunately, it killed all the horses that were in the barn, but spread to the hotel, burnt the hotel to the ground and came very close to burning down every single one of the buildings on the way. So the ashes and the sparks were flying. It was a windy day, but luckily not too windy. And there was no fire equipment, so they were doing bucket brigades and stuff back then. So it burned down to the ground. It took two years or so to build it back. This is a picture from 1855. It's the exact same look and footprint that he originally had. So you couldn't have told the difference. And over the years, it was a pretty uh, well-known hotel, used a lot for proms and special events. The Women's Temperance uh, Association used that to have their meetings and everything. He added on some nice porches to it. And if you zoom out from this picture, you're gonna get one of the few pictures of Chagrin where you can see the river that was in the middle of Chagrin. So this is the ravine that runs up all the way through Ridgewood on the south side, Ridge Ridge Act is the one on the south, one on the north, which would be the one on the south. So it came down, most of it's culverted over, but they only culverted over Main Street and culverted over Franklin Street. And in between those where the park is today was an open ravine. Irving Pope took over ownership of the Eggleston House and went to town on it. <laughs> Obviously he liked Victorian, and it was Victorian times. But he added on to the porches, made them a lot more ornate, added the turrets at the top. And it was also very, very popular for people all over Cleveland and everything to come here for special events and things like that. To give you an idea how large it was, today the toy store, which used to be Knoll's, and uh, Cleveland Card Company or whatever it was, was about here, and the Key Bank would be about here. It was a big building. <laughs> a lot of wish it was what time of year did it burn down? I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Good segue. Oh. Let me answer that. One. In January of 1897, it was bitterly cold. She couldn't actually have fire hydrants, but they were very rudimentary and they froze. So they went to Mr. Gates' house to get the pump wagon. The pump wagon was froze. <laughs> so they had to fight the fire with a bucket brigade. Oh. So this is a huge hotel on fire, and you got people throwing buckets of water. Buckets of water. <laughs> kind of like pissing in the wind. It's not going to do it. <laughs> so the main thing they were going to do, obviously, is try to control it so it doesn't burn down the rest of the town and let it burn. It didn't help that they stored a whole bunch of fireworks in the hotel for an upcoming event. Oh, when they hit the fireworks, the fire just expanded exponentially. So they let it burn down. Oh. How did it start? It started a fire in the end. I forgot my notes, so I remember all those notes. This is a view looking back towards where the shopping plaza is now, if you're looking at the front of Key Bank. And when it burned down, it smoldered for weeks. So it was a very hot and intense fire. The flames were probably you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet into the air. And it left an empty lot for many years. And this is looking back from Franklin Street across Trangle Park to where Key Bank is today. So this whole lot was empty. Then urban, which you're going to have to be in the urban. <clears throat> 1910 or so, they built the Harris Hardware Store, which became Nalls and Chagrin Cards. And in 1924, they built Key Bank. But this really, this was the final straw. They said, Chagrin needs a fire department. We're tired of this. So in 1897 is when the Chagrin Falls official fire department was formed in October. There's an example of their first ladder truck. 
And that ladder truck was actually in a Blossom Time Parade in 1966 or something like that? Yeah. In the 60s. So they had that for a while. <laughs> Chris keeps their equipment. You're going to see that a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. How long was that uh, ornate hotel intact between before the fire? I mean, how long did it look? I'm going to say probably 20 years at the most. Including the time when the guy put on the uh, turret? Yeah. The hotel itself really is from 1855. Irving Pope put all those stuff in over a number of years. It probably started in the 1870s. Okay, so it was there for 20, 20, almost 30 years. Thank you. About 1870, 1892. Don't hold me to the exact first date, but somewhere. Or 1897. There's the first Chagrin Falls Fire Department in all their splendor. The place up from the little rascal. <laughs> if you look carefully, I'm pretty sure this helmet, and one of those other helmets, is in the museum over there. So if you guys want to see that after the presentation, you can go look at the helmet. And they formed the first fire department. I don't know if you guys can tell from that picture where it is, but it's in the Internet Independent Order of Hotels, which is a great big white building now. So Chagrin bought these two floors. This is the fire department, and this is where Hartwood Coffee is today. Wow. And then the, they called it City Hall there, but it was the Village Hall. It was on the second floor. It's hard to tell from this picture, but this is just a great big hole in the building with a wooden door. And they would put the equipment in there. There was, a, there was a couple wagons in there. So there was an alarm up here when a fire would come. The volunteers would bring their own horses. They'd hook up all the equipment here and go to the fire. It's good news. All the equipment was here. They didn't have to unlock it from Bob's house or Pete's house. <laughs> and access to it. Uh, a few years ago, they were doing some renovations on this building. And they found this sign. This red oh, beam. Wow. So that was given to the fire department. They're probably going to use it in the new... Uh, display somehow when they redo the fire department. Yeah, cool. So that was in the 100 foot. No, 100, 100 foot. Yeah, it's not 100 feet tall. <laughs> 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 it looks like it says 100 feet. But it's not. That's like we don't have the right And they were there from 1897 to 1939 to when they moved to where they are now. This is my favorite one. The Bancroft House is the one that was just saved not too recently when the developers being torn down and set the top of Rome Hill. It's where the king of the city can look over the town. <laughs> well, Mrs. Bancroft was in her house and some of her linen caught on fire. So she put it out. A couple hours later, some more clothing caught on fire. She put it out. Over the course of three days, it kept on happening over and over again. All the paper says, we're not sure why. And it could have been, you know, solvents doing spontaneous combustions like you do with oily rags, because they're fires. But the paper says, we don't know what caused it. And then I read for a year worth of papers, and they never said what really caused it. So I don't know, it's a mystery. <laughs> but it just cracks me up. <laughs> you know what used to cause fires? Those uh, matches? Prisms. Prisms. Oh, well, this was in a. Go to mirrors. They had a lot of problems with those very things. So that'll be it. We're still there. We've solved it. It's amazing. I don't know if you guys, yeah, I don't know how you, you all know, but Chagrin Falls used to be the site of the Cuyahoga County Fairgrounds from 1877 to 1925. And for a while there, they became the west or east county and Berea was the west oh. and then Berea took over in 1925. But it was up where the high school is and that's why we have such a cool stadium for the football because it was originally built for the horse racing and for the fairgrounds. So kind of situate you where you are. These guys are sitting on the football field here. This is where the track is but the track went all the way to where you go into the high school. And this house here is still there. Mm. The track was a, a mile track, John? I think a half mile. Half mile track. <coughs> so they had horse racing there, independent of the fairgrounds, but they also had the county fair there every year. Oh, 
<laughs> and one of the reasons they had it there was Cuyahoga County's Fairground Association was made up of a lot of guys from Chagrin. So they realized, that, you know, Chagrin can make some money. Maybe we should have fairgrounds in Chagrin, even though it's nowhere near to be in the middle of the county. And they got their way since they were with most of the people on the commission. Here's some of the horse racing. They did harness, they did normal horses. They also had people run, they had cars run, all kinds of things over the years. If you look at the stadium there for Grandstand, that's the old wood one, which was about twice the size of the concrete one that we have today. The concrete one was built in 1913. But it was also a popular place to have balloons, just like it is today for Blossom. So here's a balloon about where the tennis courts are now. You can see the uh, grandstand in the background. <coughs> And some of the people that did that was Professor Ozzie Hunt and his wife Lizzie, and they were called acronauts. So they would go up in balloons and do tricks. She would hang from the balloon and do gymnastics. People would parachute out of the balloon. They also did tightrope acts. And they were very popular and they loved Chagrin so much that they moved to Chagrin and lived there for many years. I don't think you'll get the JCs hanging from balloons. I have to pay extra. Well, one time, oh, oh, everybody goes, oh. <laughs> it's very cool that they got this picture. Yeah. Back, back then, you know, not everybody had a phone and could take a picture. Right. Of that. <laughs> that guy had to be standing there and ready to take that picture, which makes me think he might have caused it. This <laughs> <laughs> time you were <laughs> Rooster and Stroud, do you guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Rooster and Stroud was on Washington Street right across from the Triangle Park. And they're in that building, the Peak Building on the left. That Peak Building used to be right in Triangle Park. So I was talking about that little ravine where the culvert, here's the culvert, here's the other culvert. There's a great big ravine here. And this is right about where the bandstand is today. When they decided to make the Triangle Park, they moved that back to Washington Street. In, in 1875, in about 1880, Brewster and Shroud started the furniture business, and we're here for almost at least 100 years because they were here in the 1980s, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> maybe even the early 90s. In 1904, <coughs> they were on the first floor, and the second floor was the telephone exchange. So you had Sarah and all the operators sitting up there. Oh, Sarah, get me in contact with Bob, and she'd work on little things. <laughs> And it was open 24 hours, and there's a woman manning at the second hour or the second shift, heating herself with a wood burning stove, and it caused a fire and it burned the building down. Oh Don't know why that little <laughs> tree house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a view looking across Washington Street that you see the interurban track. Oh, yeah. That meant Shrew was without telephone for at least a few weeks until they could redo it put it in a different location. Wow. But Bruce and Stroud rebuilt and they created this stone block building with a nice little pediment on it. And that was there for quite a while. The building is still there, but it's been redesigned a little bit. It's the white building here in this picture where Sandy is today. When we were kids, Bruce and Stroud let, used to let us play hide and seek in the store. Yeah. <laughs> so you could hide in the, underneath the furniture yeah, and the other exactly. kids right behind it. <laughs> These are people trying to sell their goods. The kids are playing in the house. I don't know if they let you. <laughs> they never found me. <laughs> <laughs> I hid there for days. You were good. <laughs> the next one is the Enterprise Feed Mill and the Chagrin Falls Electric Mill. I don't know if you guys know, but at one time, Chagrin actually had their own electric generator. And this is a, the corner of, you're looking east on Bell Street, and this is Philip Street. So this is where the Marathon gas station is. This is over manufacturing, that building's still there, and that building's still there. And that one building on the left was Greenaway's grocery store, and that's still there today. <laughs> Here's a, another view, you can see over in that building a little better. What's, what's amazing though is look at how Bell Road is anything but level. Yeah. And Philomathian Street was about 10 feet lower than Bell. It really souped down. Now it's level. Part of it's level because they put all the 
burn buildings in the road and level off the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many weeds. <laughs> well, the Enterprise Mill was the first mill in Chagrin that didn't use water power, it actually used steam power. And it was a grain mill, and if you know anything about grain mills, the powder and stuff is very combustible. They had a fire about two, three months before this fire. They caught it and were able to put it out, but then had another one very soon after it, and it spread and actually burned down the electric plant too. It was an incredibly hot fire. You can see some of the equipment that was melted down because of the fire. And because of it, Chagrin didn't have electricity for quite a while. And actually ended up going to where they started getting it from Cleveland. And I'm not sure which uh, electric distribution company they used at the time, but <laughs> they're all confused like I am. This building over here is Greenway, Greenway's grocery store. And they used to have a faux front to make it look like a two-story oh square building. But it's really just a one-story with a, a peaked attic on it. But the heat actually destroyed the faux front, so they got rid of it. But the building's still there. And I've always thought that'd be a great place for the Democratic uh, Party in Chagrin, because the building kind of leans to the left. <laughs> Township Hall. You guys probably don't remember when Township Hall used to look like that. It was a pretty big, it was the tallest building in Chicago. It was two stories, very ornate. It was built in 1874 to look like this. But it was huge. And if you look at it down, looking down Main Street, you can tell it's the largest, the tallest building in Chicago. It was taller than that. Texas Hardware is taller than the Independent Order of Bob Tells. And on the second floor, they had an opera house. And that was 15 rows of 18 seats across plus a balcony. So I'll let you guys do the math, but that's like 300 people, I think. They could sit in it. And to situate you, if you're sitting in the chairs watching the play and you're looking at the play, you're looking at Main Street. So, oh. The stage was actually on the street side, and you went in the back way to come up into the stage. It was also the first home of the Chagrin Valley Little Theater. Uh, it was actually a much bigger stage than what they have today in the theater. Chagrin used it from the high school for plays. They had speakers there. They had operas there. They had abolitionists. Well, not abolitionists, but no. Suffrage. 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 Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Slavery one way or another. In 1943, a fire started behind the stage. So again, if you look, that's the GAR building where the fellow flower is today. It burned out of control. They weren't able to really catch it in time before it actually just destroyed the upper floor and all the infrastructure and everything. The roof collapsed. Oh. Here's a view from the balcony looking down into the, the seats. And they did a job. Well, unfortunately, this was 1943, right in the middle of the World, World War II. So they didn't have the money to rebuild it. But they decided to scale back quite a bit. So they removed the second floor completely, removed the, the two wings from the second floor and rebuilt a much, much smaller cupola. But they were able to, at the top of the cupola, there's a weather vane. Henry Church Jr. built that weather vane. It was on the original. And it survived the fire, and they were able to put it back on the, oh, cool. the redone one. There's been talk over the years that, you know, maybe we should rebuild that back to what it was. And when you see them side by side, you think, well, it's a good idea. <laughs> That wouldn't be cheap. Yes. Uh, it was a cool bill. Rooster and Stroud again. I'm starting to wonder about their insurance. <laughs> In 1951, they had their warehouse in this building. So this is River Street, 17 grills about over here on the left. This started life as the shoe peg factory, right? 
And shoe pegs were little tiny woody things that they would help the heels to your shoes instead of nails. She could have made a lot of them. And people figured out nails were better. But Brewster and Straub had their inventory there that they were going to sell in their stores, but they also repaired and refinished furniture there. In 51, they had a fire there where somebody had, uh, didn't dispose of oily rags properly, and you got that spontaneous combustion when you put things together. We had a couple fires just recently in homes. You don't know what you're doing. If you put the rags there, they overheat and they can start a fire. But they caught that one and put it out. But then two months later, they think somebody with a cutting torch started a fire and it got out of control. <coughs> and it burned down quite a bit of the buildings in the area. Finch's cleaners were burned down. The buildings on the other side were burned down. The old village exchange, which is now Sushi Junkie or whatever it is, had fire damage. And the Scream Valley Little Theater, even though it's a little ways down there, had fire damage. But it was a very popular place to go watch the fire. You can see all the people watching. <laughs> but I'm always amazed when I'm looking at these pictures, when you see the guys that are fighting the fires back then, it's just guys in their street clothes without any helmets, holding the hose, trying to put the fire out. We've come a long way. Now this fine upstanding young gentleman, <laughs> he decided he would help out the firemen. So he set up a thing with drinks and food. And I don't know if you guys know who this is, but this is Mr. John Borso. <laughs> That's the tip jar right there. <laughs> John helped him out for a while, but helped himself too. <laughs> but even back then, Mr. Borso was voluntary in helping out the community. He's been doing that ever since. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> this is the first house I'm going to talk about. This house was burned down on purpose. It's not that somebody was living in it. This was located just east of the Federated Church when the Federated Church was much smaller. And what they wanted to do was build their new rectory. So they bought this property and then they gave, or told the Sugar Falls Fire Department, go ahead and burn it down. That'll get rid of most of the material and stuff. It gives the fire department the opportunity to learn how to put out fires. So they can see what's gonna happen when a fire gets into the second story or when it starts smoking this way or if the door's hot and things like that. Ways to train your guys so they don't go in there and get hurt. But it's a big fire. It's not, it's not a little thing where they're playing around. That fire totally engulfs the entire building. And they sit there and try to control it and learn from it, but mostly control it. So it looks like it's out of control, but it's not. They're sitting there supposedly knowing what they're doing, and they do. You can see a few pictures of it. But the whole goal, and that's a, the old school in the background, is to burn everything down so you have less material to remove so that you can build whatever it is you want to build without having to, pay to tear down the house. It costs more to do. And there it is almost out. That's the side of the Federated Church most of you have probably never seen. Uh, since 951, the new rectory comes this way. Although the window's still there, it looks into the church. And then when you're done, you sit around and have some fun, and after a while, it becomes Miller time. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, time to have a couple beers. Hopefully, this was after the fire, not during. <laughs> and it wasn't this guy. <laughs> so I wasn't a two-hand. Um. Village Hall, 1962. 1962 was the year that we're pretty sure we have an arsonist in Chicago. The air got off to the start of January 1st. Somebody took rags soaked in gasoline, stuck them under the back door, shut this hardware, oh. lit that on fire. It started a fire, burned the door down, did some damage to the building, but then was caught and put out. At the same time, somebody put gas soaked rags and lit them on fire underneath Reed's Hardware's barn, which is a little red barn in the municipal parking lot. And, uh, Policeman just happened to be patrolling and caught that fire really quick and didn't really do any damage. Three days later, Village Hall started on fire. 
village hall we used to be the Washington Gates House. We built this in 1874. It had a beautiful porch and a very fancy mansard roof, which gives you basically the full third floor. He used that as an attic for his kids to play in, but we used to for other things. In 1939, the village hall bought that from Mr. Shoemaker, who was the mayor at the time. <laughs> but by 1950, they had torn off that, or in the 50s, they tore off the porch. But a fire started in the basement. Nobody's sure why. It could have been arson, but I'm not saying it is arson. But the way the house is so old, it didn't have any fire breaks. So the fire shot up the external walls like a chimney, got to the attic, and the attic is all wood. So then it really took place in the attic. And it's right next to the fire department. And I, does anybody know Bill Raymond or remember Bill Raymond? Oh, yeah. well, Bill Raymond is my son-in-law's grandfather. He was the assistant fire chief. I used to always make fun of him. Were you the fire chief in the fire department for the day? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think that was Is he still alive? No, he just died. Yeah. Joan. But the, the fire was in the attic. Here you see the men trying to fight it from the ground. They had some ladders up there, but they didn't have ladder trucks. What year was that? 1962. The fire department did an excellent job. They ran into the building, and they got as much of the documentation and records as they could, and handed them out to widow notes of the village people that were councils that was around there. So they were able to save quite a bit of our records. They're also able to say, excuse me, a lot of the Sugar Falls Historical Society was in there at the time too, and they saved a lot of their artifacts. But some of the stuff was burned, some of the cemetery records and some of the other things were lost in the fire. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it's pretty heroic to run into a burning building to save paper. Yeah. It was a pretty big fire, not as big as some of the other ones that we've seen, but big enough to do a lot of damage. Most of the damage was from water and smoke to the first and second floors, but the third floor was completely destroyed. And here's right after the fire. When it was done, they were trying to figure out how are we gonna repair it and get it back to where it was. Because of the quotes that came in to replace the mansard roof, it was decided that was too expensive. So they went with a simpler plan, but they also removed all the corbeling and everything from around the building at the same time. So that's why the building looks like this now. If you see them side to side, I would love to see that building go back to the yeah. yeah. And that's our roofs. For some reason, I'm, I'm just always doing fan tents. What, okay. what time of year did the fire occur? This was January 3rd. Okay. So it was three days after the other fire. January uh, 3rd or 4th. That thing on top is the fire alarm. At one time they thought that the fire alarm actually started the fire, which would have been somewhat ironic. But it turned out that it really was the fire started in the basement. Peter's Bakery, it used to be located where Sassy Cannon was for a long time. So uh, this is a GAR building again, Ellen Flower is here today. I'm not quite sure what's in that building right now. Chagrin Chagrin this wasn't a major fire, but it was in 62 of yet. It had a very suspicious start. Nobody was quite sure why it started. It could have been arson. But again, look at the fire. You know, no helmet. The guy brought his own ladder. <laughs> <laughs> God bless them for what they did, and I wish they had better food. This picture is kind of cool. This is a 1949, Marty. Yeah. 1949 GMC pump truck. Scrim bought this in 49. And they had it until the 1980s, and then they gave it to another fire department. And then a private owner bought it and restored it. And then just recently, Mr. Brigham saw it for sale and he bought it and donated it to the historical society. So he's been restored. 
This is not a new picture of it. This is an old picture of it. If you look at it today, it looks exactly like this, if not better. Wow. Again, wow. 1949 GMC with an open cab. Wow. Who oh, the heck thought you could have an open, open cab in Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're fighting fire. <laughs> And if we have any volunteers that would like to drive that thing, you have to be able to lift about 300 pounds first. But it doesn't drive very easy. But we have it, and we're going to be showing it off here. Scott, I mentioned too that we are going to be building a barn in the back to house it and uh, are going to need some funds. So um, just keep your antennas up. Uh, it'd be nice uh, to be able to get that built quick. You buy a roof for it? Yes. <laughs> Is there a box back here? <laughs> <laughs> I know, you can't. It's not a convertible. That was fast. Over building. Another fire in 62. Again, suspicious circumstances. This was the over building built by Clayton Over in 1908. That's where uh, White Magnolia is today. This is Bell Street, this is Main Street. This building is still there today. So it was this cool looking chisel blocks, three stories high with a bay window. At the time it was built, they said it was fireproof. <laughs> Every time you say that, it burned down. But what it had, it had metal roof and metal between each floor. So like a fire break, a fire shouldn't go up. And on every floor, it had water supply, two hoses. So you could put fires out if they happened on that floor. And a bunch of different businesses in there. Mr. Over built it for a furniture store and undertaking. He was the first guy in the area to build a hearse. He used to show it off in parades and stuff like that. The Scrib Falls Library used to be up on the second floor, right there by the bay window. But at 62, it caught on fire. Chagrin and Bainbridge showed up to put it out. Again, they're not sure why it started. But here the fire department has a little more equipment than they did just a few months before the other fire, which is kind of weird. But it burned and totally destroyed the third floor, and the water damage ruined the second and the first floor. The second floor was the Cleveland Institute of Music. And they ended up leaving and never coming back. The first floor was the Valley Hardware Store with John Kenning, mm -hmm. and he was in that building for quite a while. When the fire burned, he resupplied his inventory or into the store. And here's right after the grand opening, after it was reopened. What they did was they tore down the third floor completely, and they just reclad the stone with brick on the west side and the north side. If you go around in the back or go around and come in from the parking lot, you can still see the chiseled stone. Some of them still have charred from the fire. So if you get bored, sneak down that little alley. <laughs> Nobody yelled. I've been back there. How do you get back there anymore? Well, first you hide in Brewster and Strauss furniture store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Damn it, tell it. No, uh, Right here, there's a little alley. That's yeah, but it's really little. Like when I, I could what? go when I was a kid, but not now. But you come in from the come in from the parking lot. Uh -huh. You know, if you go past where the Amber and Jordan is and everything. Yeah. Turn left and coming back that way, there's a little atrium, and you can see it there. Oh, okay. An oh, okay. atrium behind the Bradley. Building. How come you didn't yell at me when I was there? What year was that? 1962, when we had all the fires that were very suspicious. And that's the two buildings before and after. I would have liked, again, that one to maybe have been that the way it was. I missed the bay windows. All right, hold on. What's the fourth light on the traffic light? I, I just had that. It was, it was a walk light. No fires. <laughs> Good answer. I remember that. It was a walk light. It was a walk light. Yeah. 
That makes sense. That's when you cut diagonally across. Yeah. Yeah. Here's John involved in a fire. I forgot to mention, the fire in 1951 that John was helping out on, his grandfather's cleaners burned down as part of that fire. And then John was involved in this fire. This is John's barn. And do you want to explain what happened here, John? Uh, the, uh, the Woodward children went up into the barn and were playing with matches. And uh, the fire started, and as they tried to get out, um, they knocked the fire down to the, the, the bottom floor. And uh, so the building became engulfed. So, so that's me. Dwight Woodward? Yes, Dwight, Dwight's sister. We never liked them. <laughs> they burned down my barn. So that, that's, uh, that's myself and Wade Groff. Looking at this, we were renting. We were renting part of the garage to this gentleman with this car. 1937 Chevy. Wow. So where was that house? That's on Franklin Street, 120 South Franklin. But that isn't your house, is it? Yes, mm -hmm. the backyard. Oh, the backyard. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 63. The Valley Lutheran Church wanted to expand, so here's the church one on the small. This building here was owned by Windsor, and it was the nurses' dorm. And the church bought it, along with some other buildings on around it, and wanted to add the new rectory, so they had it burned down. In this case, they had seven different fire departments there to learn on how to handle fires. This is a pretty big fire. It was done in January, so again, it was pretty cold. You can see a lot of firemen in this one standing around looking at it, trying to understand what's going to happen when a fire is in the house. So this is right across the street from where the library is. And again, the, the main purpose of this is to burn as much down as you can so there's very little to remove when you build a new addition. So basically what you get to is all that's left is foundation stones and the brick from the chimney. Anything that would burn would burn because of the heat of the fire. And then that allowed the church to actually do that addition. So that addition was from 1963. How many people remember the dump on Solon Road? Yeah. 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 How many people went there with three things and went home with five? Yeah. <laughs> it was a very unregulated dump. You could pretty much throw whatever you wanted there. Well, in 64, they had a fire at the dump. And you have to be careful with a fire at a dump because you don't know what's there. Here's a guy with a little hose trying to get out of the fire. You don't know if you're putting out paper or putting out a 55 gallon drum of gas. You know? Where was it located? Do you know where River Run Baseball Field and the dog park is? Yeah. Just past Patton Garden? Well, this was the impetus to get rid of the dump. So, what they did, at least my understanding, was they took the dirt from when they did Citadel and uh, Knob Hills and covered over the the dump. I have no details on how that was done and whether there's bodies buried under there. I'm just noticing there's a mailbox down here. We've got to figure out who's in there. Oh, yeah. There's a name on it. Four or so. Looks like a treasure, maybe. They put it out, like I said, they finally realized that we probably shouldn't have an unregulated dump. You remember when Knob Hill was being built and they were advertising for it overlooking the beautiful Supreme Valley no, dump? <laughs> <laughs> Bar barbecues every weekend. <laughs> this is the biggest fire in Chagrin's history in terms of real estate or acreage. In 1965, Rowan Giles was in the same location that the Enterprise feed mill was. So 
But after that burned down, this is again the corner of Bell Street and that's Bill Gateway Street. Yeah. Rowan Giles were very popular in the area. They built a lot of homes. They sold dimensional lumber, but they also milled lumber there. So they had a lot of milling equipment, a lot of sawdust. The entire location there, I'll show you this aerial view. Here's the 1914 high school. Here's you guys sitting in this building. This is the old 1885 school when it was in the Philip Nathan parking lot. <coughs> Here they're building the gym and the auditorium. So this is from 1940. But this area from here, two acres of land, a wooden building full of wood and sawdust and other things. And that's not even all the buildings. That's what it looked like in 1940. It got much bigger than that over the years. 1965, a gentleman was driving down to work early in the morning, saw some smoke, went to the police station, told him. By the time they got there, the old saying where there's smoke, there's fire. The fire had already taken over a lot of the building. It got so bad that the kids in the Philomathian school, on their way to school, were being bussed and turned around, or if they were at the school, were sent home. And I was at the bus stop waiting to go to Lewis Sand School, which is up at the high school. Bus arrives, all the middle school kids get off and say, They're burning down the school! Hey! <laughs> we were all excited, what's going on? But then they made us get on the bus and go to school. But this again, there were seven fire departments there. That's Mr. Kenny, if you guys remember Mr. Kenny. Gas station. Yeah, these are the apartments that are still there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the Bell Street back in the town. There's the Federated Church. We have a lot of pictures of this fire. A lot of people were there taking pictures. Again, this was the case where the fire, a lot, this happens a lot with fires. The fire department's goal is to contain it and not let it burn other buildings that are not on fire yet. They're not there to try to put that fire out so much as they're trying to protect the other ones first. Obviously, the first thing is to keep the firefighters safe, but then try to put the fire out. But when you got a building full of kindling and fire and sawdust and stuff like that, it's going to real there. Didn't have trouble lighting that one. <laughs> <laughs> now you see all these black and white pictures, and it looks, you know, it's pretty bad. Once you oh, see it in wow. color, you realize that was a raging inferno. Oh my God. Wow. So so this is a view from the Philomathian parking lot. I talked to the school. This is where Goodrich's uh, orthodontist yeah. place is today. So Marathon is right here on the corner. This is the parking lot today. Wow. So if you look at those flames, they're <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of feet into the sky. Yeah. The heat from that fire, if we were sitting in this building tonight, you would feel the heat from that fire. That's how hot it was. Look at that. <coughs> That's not your little fire. It burned for, actually, not as long as you would think. It was only a matter of maybe four to five hours before it was cold and burned down. When it burned down, that was an open lot for quite a while until they built that shopping strip mall where uh, air hairdresser is today. And then they built the uh, gas station. And then Goodrich built his, uh, he did build it, but that office. And then another Finch's Cleaners. In 1966, there used to be a cleaners at the corner of Oak Street and Franklin. It happened to be owned by John Borisow's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a pattern here that, when did you leave Chagrin, John? For a while? Is that old number 49? It looks yeah, like it's a truck. Yeah, it's yeah, 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 number 49. You're going to see it a few times this year. Sure. Well, anytime you have a cleaners, Solvent. solvents and clothing and stuff like that, it's going to burn, it's going to burn hard. And that's what happened here. They hoped to rebuild it, but they never did. They burned it down to the ground. 
now it's an empty lot. I don't think that furniture there is from the original cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's still not, this was taken off of Google Maps. So it's not the the cleaners yeah. used to have a, a giant St. Bernard dog and we used to ride it all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Harris Lumberyard. Uh, so here's the next lumberyard. Now there were there was always the Joe. There were three lumberyards in Chagrin. There was Hancock, Karras, and Rowan Giles. So everybody thought that Hancock burned down the two. <laughs> but, but there's no truth to this. This used to be located across from where the roller rink is, on the other side of the train tracks that used to be there. The trust was not there. I think this might have been arson because prior to this burning down, they got a few reports to the police of suspicious people in the area. They thought they were kids. But at the same time, there was a storm and lightning hit near this area too. So nobody knows for sure what caused it. But this was a lumber yard with a whole lot of dimensional wood. They didn't do mill work like Rowan Childs. They just sold lumber. But again, you have a building full of kindling you're going to have a pretty hot fire. And here's a looking underneath the trussel towards the fire. So you're standing kind of in front of the roller rink looking backwards. Wow. Again, those flames were two, three hundred feet in the air. <laughs> it was said. Wasn't there a coal yard there too? Yeah, you, you stole my best one. <laughs> <laughs> They said that the fire got so hot that the fireman's boots melted. So you know it was hot. You give an example of how hot it is. You get through the next picture. It was a steel girder building. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. You know it's a hot fire when the steel girders melt like that. Oh, my God. I don't know about that truck. I stayed in that field for years. Yep. Yeah. That what was amazing for the fire department though was, here's a fire, really hot. These are gas tanks. Oh. 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 Right here are coal temples. You yeah. know what a coal temple is? It's basically an area where you dump coal so you can deliver from the train there and then take the coal to the homes. So you got things over there that can explode, cause all kinds of damage, and just pass that at our homes. So the fire department's main goal is keep those from catching fire, let that thing burn. And they did a good job because those never, never had any problem. The embankment probably protected the coal yard. That's hard to tell. Huh? There was some damage to the trussel. So I'll bet. So the trussel's on the gun. No, yeah. They had to do some repair. But, by the way, that's what the location looks like today. So that's where Pine Street is, Sugar Road. Then we went wild without any big fires uh, until Joey's Restaurant in 2011. So this is when Joey's first opened, way before the fire. But it was in the uh, Bradley Bay where the uh, flip side is today. And they got, got the reserve on the right. And this is Met White Angolia now. You start to see that the firemen now start to have better equipment. They have oxygen masks and much better personal protective equipment, PPE. And you can see they have a lot better technology to put out the fire, too. Uh, it's hard to see from this picture, but they now have the capability to shoot water down from above as opposed to standing on the ground going, God, I would like that to be something. <laughs> They think the fire started in the kitchen. It obviously it destroyed Joyce completely. Belkin uh, had the business on the second floor. That was totaled out. White Magnolia had a lot of smoke damage and water damage. And where the reserve is also had some major damage. But again, you can see it's much better equipment. And I, I'm not quite sure how they got that hose. Well, he's on the 100-foot building or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> It's not from the ladder truck. But they have the ladder track, and you know, they got the capability to get things up there and put the fire out a lot better than they used to. Yeah, we have paper too, so. 
Then a couple years later, Jekyll came down. Well, Jekyll's was located on where 17 Grill is today, or 17 River Grill is today. It was in a building that was part of the old mills that were there. There's a small sawmill and a plane mill there. O'Malley's plane mill was there for a while. Finch, Finch Cleaners was there too. That's where Finch Cleaners was. Yeah, and John's first fire was. <laughs> <laughs> It was down in country. It was down in country with Jug Platts yeah. on River Street. Right. What really hindered this fire is the fire alarm didn't go off because it failed. So nobody knew they had a fire. So the fire detection and alarms didn't go off. And when the fire department got there, they think it was caused by a circuit breaker short, but the circuit box was shorting and arcing so badly that you couldn't even get close to it. It looked like something out of Frankenstein. Oh. So the fire department obviously is not going to go into danger to try to put out the fire. Right. They had to stay outside and just try to keep the fire contained. Mm. But it ended up gutting and destroying the building. Oh. And they rebuilt it back to 17 Grill with more view of the river. So in the, in the end run, it yeah. might have been a good thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And lastly, you can't talk about fires in Chagrin without talking about a certain individual that's famous for fires. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Ted, Ted graduated from Chagrin in 1977. And in 1976, he needed money to go to prom. So he bet everybody, I can light myself on fire and jump off the falls. <laughs> and we said, you're full of crap. We'll take that bet. Wish I could have my money back. You got to remember, this is before the internet. So where do you go to find out, how do I light myself on fire without dying? I don't think they carry that book in the life. But, but he figured it out. If you had seen him that night, he wondered how the hell Ted is still alive. But he lit himself on fire. This is not the original. This is one of them. But he lit himself on fire and jumped off into the falls. <laughs> and he recreated this a number of times over the years. A few of the times getting arrested for doing it. A few of the times the police kind of just looked the other way. Because it was cool. On the 30th anniversary of it, the police condoned go ahead and do it. And the reason they did that was by then, Ted had, Ted had been a stuntman for a while. But he'd also become relatively famous for doing burns, so much so that he was invited to do Burning Man a few years. And at one time, he had the Guinness World Book of Records for being on fire without breathing equipment for almost three minutes. <laughs> it's been broken since by some guy that burned him. <laughs> but it has been broken. He also, at one time, held the record for the most people on fire at one time. I think it was like 31 people. <laughs> uh, he's made a, a cottage industry. I caught him practicing in my backyard one time. You <laughs> burn all the grass and you go to your own backyard. It wasn't by care. I gotta tell you a bachelor story. One night we heard pounding on our front door on Miles Road. And it was back in the day when you went to the door at 3 a.m. You didn't worry. Yeah. And my husband goes to the door and this guy's here. He says, my motorcycle ran out of gas. I can have you got a big garage. I thought you might have a can of gas. And he introduces himself. Yeah. You ran out of gas? He's probably using it for his car. The funniest part is he's not the funniest or weirdest guy in his family. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, no way. Not in downtown. I meant downtown. 